Hi, everybody. We're going to switch gears a little bit. My name is Danny Race, and I'm from, I'm chairing the multidisciplinary group in Halifax, which increasingly, increasingly has become an Atlantic Canada network, which is great. Um, as, as you know, Atlantic Canada has lots of fresh fish, but thankfully, uh, uh, as, as per our New Orleans colleague, no alligators yet. I'm having enough anxiety kayaking with the increasing number of sharks we're fe seeing, so I really don't need alligators. So these are my disclosures. Only thank to CNETs for spending uh, some funds to get me here. So I appreciate the invitation to be with you all. So goals of care. Ideally, our surgical colleagues would be curing everybody. I guess from everybody's perspective, ideally these tumors wouldn't happen at all. But I think even our surgeons would understand, know, and very clearly demonstrate that unfortunately they can't cure everybody. So we always have to remember that when surgical cure isn't possible, the treatment should not be worse than the disease. And that's really a paraphrase from, from Osler, who was really one of the grandfathers of modern medicine. And really, the ultimate goal for patients with metastatic disease, in other words, that can't be approached with curative impact, is really the prolongation of good quality of life and survival. And so how do we do that? We do that to try, by trying to minimize disease-related complications, disease-related symptoms, but always in the context of also having to minimize the side effects of our treatment, right? And getting that balance right for every patient is really the key to longer-term good quality disease control. Now, it's important to understand that this changes all the time. So bear with me with this little cartoon. This blue line represents what we hope to achieve by our different treatments, our cycles of treatment, perhaps our types of treatment increasing response rates, right? Increasing chance of disease control. But we know that the more we add, the more we do, the longer we do it, even very minimal side effects become problematic and cumulative and eventually start eroding quality of life, eventually leading to a possible decline in what we're trying to do. And if you think about it, for every single patient, not just with neuroendocrine tumors, but perhaps more relevantly for neuroendocrine tumors, given how long patients can be on treatment for, this is constantly shifting, right? These curves, everybody has their different set of curves, and there's no real good way to predict it, which illustrates some of the difficulties in really outlining a clear path for everybody. Now, there's some unique factors that we factor in, not just from a medical perspective, from, but from all our perspectives. The rate of tumor progression. We all focus on the KI-67, but remember that's a little biopsy, right? We know that there are different KI-67s in the same tumor. We just, and we never know where our KI-67 is truly heading. What we do learn a lot is watching things change over time or not. Millimeters without symptoms versus faster growth makes a big difference. Millimeters without symptoms or faster growth with or without, with, or, with or without symptoms also makes a big difference. So some of these questions are, we should be asking every single time we try and make a treatment decision for every one of our patients. The presence or absence of syndrome, of course, makes a big difference, right? Anybody with a syndrome related to neurotic tumor has symptoms that impact quality of life. And the severity and type of syndrome can be very different. Right? Carcinoid syndrome, and I don't have to elaborate on that, is very different from the syndrome that's caused by an insulinoma. And we have to approach these situations entirely differently because the syndrome leads to different consequences. And finally, and increasingly in Canada, and of course globally, does the tumor express somatostatin receptors and is there potential access and role of PRT? So all of these factors, probably more than any other solid tumor, come into play when we think of medical management on an ongoing basis. So the key questions, does this patient need treatment at this time? Historically, that was called a wait and see approach. I, I've always hated that term. A much better approach is something called expectant management, where you're actually surveying, monitoring, meeting with folks, assessing clinically and by scans, and deciding at each point in time, is treatment relevant or is a change in treatment relevant? It's no longer wait and see, just come back and call us when you have problems. Everybody should be actively, expectantly managed, knowing that we will have to do something, even for some patients that might choose not to do anything for now. Is the change on the scan significant enough to pose a threat or to change or add treatment? 
is there something we can do to target the specific area of disease, like all of our treatments that are designed to impact the liver? And you'll hear a lot more about that. And finally, are there surgical options? And all these questions keep getting revisited, whether, and it should be, these should be revisited in a multidisciplinary context uh, with everybody at the table. Again, a very important point, I think, treat the patient, not just the number or the pictures. We've heard a lot about scanxiety. I've a I added two more terms that I've obviously made up, chromogranxiety and 5-HIA-xiety. That last one's a tough one to say. Again, just to illustrate the point that you heard earlier this morning, that not all tests are needed for everybody, not all the time, and they d don't necessarily add to quality of life or treatment decisions. Okay, so moving on to treatment options, somatostatin analogs, and I know this room is very, very familiar with somatostatin analogs. Um, we know that for neuroendocrine tumors of small intestinal and pancreatic, pancreatic origin, there's what we call level one evidence, the highest level of evidence we have in clinical trials, with three main goals, right? Control of syndrome, perhaps not for insulinoma, where there's a more effective option. Prolongation of disease stability, it's very important that there's really no tumor shrinkage with somatostatin analogs. The goal is stabilization and delay or avoid complications of the disease. Those are the three real main goals of somatostatin analogs. For other NETs, non-small intestinal, non-pancreatic, there's no high level evidence, but we often extrapolate the benefit, assuming that other, patient, other NET patient populations will likely derive similar benefit, but there's always some uncertainty. And for many patients and for uh, across the world, these medicines are really first-line therapy due to efficacy, the evidence, the, st the um, tolerability, and in Canada, the excellent, excellent patient support programs that provide access in general. Usually, we think of somatostatin analogs for truly well-differentiated disease, as documented by our pathologist, with relatively lowish KI-67 values, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in the round table. Two options that everybody here is familiar with, um, one of which is delivered by intramuscular injection, the other is by subcutaneous. Both very well tolerated in general, and I put a smiley face from the oncologist's perspective, because compared to what we normally talk about with patients, and you have to always remember that many oncologists do give pretty toxic chemotherapy. So sometimes we're a little bit blind or deaf, as we heard this morning, to what the patient experiences is when we think of somatostatin analogs. Overall, we think generally well tolerated. I'm sure we'll talk about it. Um, the one big issue that we do have to be aware of, as you heard this morning, is that somatostatin analogs do result in fat malabsorption which can paradoxically make diarrhea and bowel control worse, and in some patients, a lot worse. Um, as well, and the reason why many people eventually have their gallbladders removed, either at the time of surgical intervention or subsequently, is that long-term use of somatostatin analogs slightly increases the risk of gallbladder sludge and stones, and so removing the gallbladder can be a preventive uh, type of intervention. Well, what's next if the disease progresses? And remember, progression is sometimes this is the eye of the beholder. So if you go back to basic principles in the first <coughs> couple of slides, radiology will call progression any change by one or two millimeters, because that's true. But I think from a medical perspective, it's very important that we understand that the goal of somatostatin analogs is to slow progression, delay significant change. And for some patients, one to two millimeters every of growth every six to 12 months actually leads to very long, good quality survival without jumping into new therapy. But for those patients who do have progression with um, more pace, we often think of dose escalation of somatostatin analogs. Um, it's often recommended, very important to know, there's very little evidence, very low level evidence, as you increase the dose of somatostatin analogs, the diarrhea can problems, when they arise, can become worse. Um, if it's helpful, and for some patients definitely it can be, the duration of benefit is usually relatively short. So it's not generally a long-term fix, if you will, for either progression or for control of syndrome. Of course, as you increase injection, either frequency or dose, there could be more discomfort, more inconvenience, 
And usually we should be thinking of it as potentially helpful as a bridge to the next intervention. Okay. So from a medical perspective, we often turn to uh, second line therapy with what we used to call targeted therapy, and we still do, you'll hear that word. We're realizing it's really not so targeted, to be honest. Um, two agents that some of you have experienced with, Everolimus, that have, has level one evidence for nets of GI, pancreatic, and lung origin, and sinitinib, really restricted to those with pancreatic origin net. Um, these are oral, so pills, taken once daily, and the goals are kind of similar, prolongation of stability or to stabilize progressing disease, okay? The tumor response rates, the tumor shrinkage rates, reliably are less than 10%. So again, some patients will have disease that shrinks with these agents. Most, for most patients, the goal is taking something that's slowly progressing and stabilizing it, all right? Um, just a word about a med another type of targeted therapy that you may be hearing about over the next few years, which in an early study perhaps shows a little bit more tumor shrinkage rates. Um, this is not available in Canada yet, not indicated in Canada yet. It's just an FYI for the next few years. Now, again, these pills can be very well tolerated, but Everolimus comes with a cost, just like surgery comes with a cost. Many patients develop mouth sores of various sort, can be very exhausted, rash or diarrhea. Those, those t side effects usually are quite quickly apparent within the first two to six weeks of starting treatment. And usually we can adjust the dose to try and minimize the impact. But it's very rare that we can truly get rid of the impact. Over months, patients can develop uh, uh, lung inflammation that can become a very serious problem and mandates immediate discontinuation of the drug. And again, over months, some people develop problems with blood sugar, which if unnoticed or unrecognized, can be a real problem. With sunitinib, again, many patients can tolerate it well, but fatigue, something called hand-foot syndrome, where people get a sunburn, where the second most unlikely spot, palms of hands and soles of feet, I'll let you think of the first most unlikely spot. It can cause hypertension, increases risk of blood clots, and patients can develop hypothyroidism, which again, if not recognized, can be a source of fatigue and other symptoms. So although these are target therapies, they're pill treatments in general, um, they're not as easy as we would like them to be, from, even from an oncology perspective, never mind a patient perspective. Last few minutes on newer options. And one, the first one's really not so new, to be honest with you. It's taken old, drugs we've had for a long time, but packaging a little bit different. So many times when we think of chemotherapy, um, we think of this type of picture, correct? Uh, we now know that a lot of our treatments are oral and pill form. And um, you heard this morning, um, our pay, uh, Lynn, I believe Lynn, discussed the fact that she was on her treatment called CAPTEM for 24 cycles, if I recall correctly. That's almost two years of chemotherapy. This is real chemotherapy. The best evidence is in the neuroendocrine tumor with pan uh, from pancreatic origin, but it's now often considered uh, in a wider variety of patients with neuroendocrine tumors with clearly progressive disease with impending threat to health, all right? And those are two, I think, very important factors. We tend to uh, think of this in, in situations where the disease is not behaving terribly well. It's a two week on, two week off treatment with two types of chemo drugs. One is given for 14 days in purple and the red is given the last five days and then two weeks break. What's really been remarkable about this, and these are old drugs, this is nothing new guys, is that because of the doses that are used, the side effect profile from an oncology perspective, when we're used to dealing with terrible side effects from all our, all our awful treatments, is remarkably manageable for the majority of patients, and which is why our patient, our, our patient colleague this morning was able to stay on this for two years. So this very quick graph just shows you the significant, the severe toxicities that have developed in a very large review of 15 studies using this regimen, and it's basically all under 5%, which is really quite remarkable and the side effects can oftentimes be managed by simply changing the dose and schedule. So the tolerance is quite something. When I finished my training, 
that blue bar at the bottom was what we, were th we used to think of with chemotherapy. Okay, and this was a very aggressive, highly toxic treatment for neuroendocrine tumors. At the top is where we stand now with capecitabine temozolomide. Not only is it remarkably much uh, well tolerated in general, it's also remarkably more effective for the right patient than what we used, eight, I won't say how long ago, but a long time ago. <laughs> Last concept and a new option, in a, and a, we're talking about a different patient population for inadequate control of carcinoid syndrome, diarrhea. You've heard a lot about diarrhea already this morning. Just a reminder of how it, about how effective somatostatin analogs can be in controlling diarrhea. That peak in that graph is after two weeks of patients uh, basically not being on somatostatin analog, and the resumption of control is when patients get restarted on somatostatin analog. So for a large majority of patients, SSAs are incredibly helpful. But we know 40 to 50 percent will require breakthrough somatostatin analog due to symptoms. And we also know that over the long haul, for patients with, in, with carcinoid syndrome, there is a risk to the heart valves. You've heard that mentioned a few times today. Just if you can compare these two valves, the one on your right, I believe, no, the one on your left is a normal tricuspid heart valve, very thin, very translucent. The one on the other one is a patient with carcinoid heart disease. You can see how thick and nodular that is, and that is a result of long-term overproduction of serotonin with carcinoid syndrome. So you've seen this cartoon in different ways, and the new agent uh, that, that is uh, discussed now in Canada is called Teletristat. Teletristat etoprate, or the trade name is Zermelo, targets the first step of the conversion of tryptophan, which you've heard about, to the next step along the, path, along the road to make serotonin, all right? And by doing so, tries to reduce the level of serotonin in circulation, thereby improving diarrhea for patients on a somatostatin analog, but without good control. It's one pill taken three times a day, very well tolerated with really no significant side effects. And the goal is really to decrease diarrhea for patients with carcinoid syndrome already on a somatostatin analog. It's an add-on to SSA therapy. About 40% of patients have a durable response when they're on the treatment with a significant reduction in the number of bowel movements. There's also, there also can be a reduction in 5-HIAA, which you know correlates with the serotonin levels. Remember, there's no anti-cancer effect per se. It's just targeting that serotonin production, and we really don't know if there's any impact on the development of carcinoid heart disease. So that's, that's, uh, that's all I really wanted to share. Um, again, I think the, the composition of this panel illustrates that there's a plethora of treatments, and really, in, in a lot of our views, all of the treatment options, whatever specialty we come from, may be relevant for an individual at some point in their disease course. And um, that's ideally the goal behind the multidisciplinary teams that hopefully take care of everybody. Thanks. <laughs>